Hello and welcome to this presentation in which I will introduce you to Alcatel Lucent Enterprises Intelligent SPV Fabric. Rather than talking too much about the fundamentals, packet headers and so on, I will give you 10 reasons to pay attention to this technology by going over 10 facts in 15 minutes. My name is Patricio Martello and I'm a Solutions Architect at ALE. And without further ado, let's get on with it. Number one. The first thing to know about SPB is that it's an all-in-one Swiss knife solution. And what do I mean by that? It means that you can tackle different problems with it. You can use it in the campus. And in fact, SPB was first conceived as a replacement for spanning tree. Spanning tree is an ancient protocol designed to prevent loops. However, it can be a real source of headaches because spanning tree misconfigurations or errors can result in a complete network meltdown. On top of that, spanning tree is very inefficient and wastes network capacity, resulting in poor performance. SPB came to fix all that with a modern, robust protocol that makes networks stable and performant. But it's not just the replacement of spanning tree. It adds multi-tenancy with both layer 2 and layer 3 VPNs, and that makes it ideal for micro-segmentation and for IoT in particular. The second area is the data center. You can use SPB to build data center fabrics spanning one or multiple sites. These fabrics provide any-to-any -any connectivity over optimal low-latency paths, making it ideal for modern virtualized or private cloud environments. The third area is the WAN. SPB offers layer 2 and layer 3 VPN services, which are similar to MPLS services, yet much simpler to deploy and operate. The services can deliver multi-tenanted connectivity to multiple sites connected across the WAN. The fact that you can address all three problems with one solution is quite unique to SPB. Instead of having three different solutions such as spanning tree in the campus, VXLAN overlays in the data center, and MPLS in the WAN, you can do all three with one protocol. And this reduces the complexity of managing multiple dissimilar technologies. Number two, what also enables the use of a single solution for multiple problems is having consistent support of this protocol and related features across all the required product lines. If you compare that with other technologies, let's take MPLS for example, sure, it can be a good fit for the WAN, but you may find that it is not supported on access layer switches or data center switches. And even if it is, you may find those products are lacking other required features, such as network admission control, etc. But at ALE, we have SPB support across the board with consistent feature set and same operating system. Or modular switches with high density and capacity that you can use at the core, aggregation or access layers. On compact switches that you can use as a topo rack in the data center or in a spine and leaf architecture, but you can also use them as a compact core in the campus. And these switches also provide high capacity wire rate performance in a compact form factor. At the access layer on the advanced access switches that can also be used as a small core offering multi-gig performance and HPOE while still supporting a broad range of access layer security features. And even on environmentally hardened switches for harsh environments with an extended temperature range for challenging EMC, EMI while still offering HPOE and supporting the same range of features. Finally, it is also supported on the OmniVista NMS to visualize topology, paths, and to configure SPV services through a friendly GUI. Bottom line is that not only SPV is suitable for use in campus, data center, and WAN, but it is broadly supported across the board with a consistent feature set and the same operating system. And you cannot say the same about other technologies that SPB is sometimes compared to, such as MPLS or EVPN, because support for those technologies can be patchy. Number three, a little known fact about SPB is that it is not based on IP. It uses ISIS, 
routing protocol which does not rely on IP, which means it's not vulnerable to IP-based attacks. SPB core nodes do not have IP addresses, and they do not route traffic, they bridge it. Any routing is done at the point of entry, the edge node, and is bridged over the shortest path to the destination. To be 100% precise, SPB core nodes do have IP addresses for management purposes, but those addresses are isolated from user traffic and not in line with it. Those IP interfaces are not involved in user traffic forwarding in any way. So, since these nodes do not have IP addresses, they are essentially invisible to any network scanning, discovery, or hacking tools which use IP. Let's imagine a hacker wanted to cause trouble. The first step in hacking is reconnaissance, then network discovery and scanning. Typical hacking tools include Nmap and Metasploit. But these tools and 99% of all hacking techniques rely on IP communication, which makes them effectively useless when the nodes do not even use the IP protocol. Bottom line is that by not using IP, the network is not vulnerable to IP-based attacks. Number four, as an IEEE standard, SPB not only interoperates with other vendors' SPB implementation, but it is also backwards compatible and interoperates with other protocols. What this means is that SPB adoption does not require a forklift upgrade. At layer two, it interoperates with all previous IEEE standards such as either to the one q q and q or LACP. Therefore, an SPB migration can start at the aggregation and core layers, whilst the access layer can wait until the next refresh cycle. At layer three, routing in and out towards external non-SPB networks can use standard protocols such as OSPF, ISIS, or BGP. And this is also valid for multicast traffic, which can interoperate through protocol-independent multicast and its different variants. Bottom line, SPB can interoperate at layer 2, layer 3, and not just unicast, but also multicast traffic. And the benefit is investment protection. There is no need for a big bang forklift upgrade because the migration can be performed in phases and aligned with refresh cycles. Number 5. SPB is an ideal solution for macro and micro segmentation. First, because it makes it really easy to create virtual segments for different user communities or device types without increasing the operational complexity as you do so. And second, because it's fully integrated with Access Guardian, which is the network admission control framework, such that mapping of users or devices to their segment can be dynamic and policy driven. If you want to know more about network segmentation, you can visit the link to watch my presentation on this topic. In short, SPB makes it easier to adopt a zero-trust framework based on software-defined segmentation. Number six, SPB comes with simpler built-in network automation. First, right out of the box, when you interconnect the switches, they automatically create an SPB backbone without you having to type a single CLI command. SPB services are also automatically created for the traffic that is received. Attachment of other devices is automatic as well, whether we are talking about other ALE or third-party switches, hypervisors in the data center, or wireless access points. The intelligent fabric detects the connection and self-configures, which makes it self-healing because when something fails or is disconnected or reconnected somewhere else, the change is detected and the network reconfigures on the fly. If you would rather do things manually, this is still much simpler than other options because any service configuration is done on the edge nodes only. So even if you want to configure a service between different locations which are linked over multiple hops and across the WAN, there is no touch required on intermediate core nodes. Only the concerned edge nodes need to be configured. And this can be done through a friendly GUI using the OmniVista NMS. Lastly, SPB relies on a single protocol for loop prevention, optimal paths, and layer 2 and layer 3 PNs, and that's including both IP version 4 and IP version 6. 
Compare that to other technologies such as MPLS or EVPN that require a stack of protocols such as label distribution protocol, an interior gateway protocol such as OSPF, and multi-protocol BGP. And that's just to get you started because you need to keep adding more protocols for additional features or if you want to run IP version 6 and not just IP version 4. Juggling multiple protocols makes network operations and troubleshooting much more complex. SPB can replace those protocols with a single one, making it simpler to deploy and troubleshoot. Bottom line, SPB is much simpler than other options that it is sometimes compared to. It is much simpler to deploy and operate. Number seven. Another little known fact about SPB is that it can run in parallel with existing legacy designs based on VLANs, routing, etc. What this means is that it can be enabled on the same devices and on the same interfaces and will run like ships in the night with your existing design. Both technologies can be enabled independently and without conflicting with one another. Why does this matter? Well, with more and more IoT use cases, there is a need to create virtual segments for those IoT devices, and SPB is ideal for that. At the same time, there is no rush to fix what is not broken. So, if your current design based on VLANs and routing is serving you well, you can keep it. But you can also add SPB segments for new IoT use cases such as building automation, security, surveillance, biomed devices, etc. Bottom line, this enables a phase migration. There is no rush to fix what is not broken and at the same time we can achieve some quick wins by implementing SPB segmentation for specific use cases. Number 8. Another little known fact about SPB is that it can be extended over third-party networks. We see an example in the one here, but this is also useful in the LAN. In this example, there's a mix of service providers providing connectivity between different sites. One may be Metro Ethernet and the other one could be MPLS or Microwave, even Dark Fiber, DWDM or SD-WAN. The challenge here is that any change to service configuration requires stitching multiple services across different providers, which means raising tickets and, and can cost time and money. This hodgepodge of stitched services is also complex to manage and troubleshoot. What you can do instead is run SPB over those disparate third-party networks. And this abstracts the complexity of the underlying network. You can self-manage services end-to-end, -end, and these services can span not just the WAN, but the WAN plus the LAN or the WAN plus the data center in one continuous homogeneous service. So you can reap the benefits of SPB even in a mixed vendor or service provider environment. Number nine, the SPB i5 is dynamic, is elastic, and this makes it more secure. Let's illustrate it with an example. In this higher education example, let's imagine that there's a STEM project, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Since students and faculty will be conducting tests as part of the project, we create an isolated network segment, which we aptly name STEM project. Currently, there's a number of students and faculty working on this project. They have authenticated with their network credentials, and they have access to this dedicated segment wherever they might be, from the lab itself, from the library, or somewhere else around campus. Now, a student wants to work on this project from the dorm. He or she connects and authenticates to the network. The segment is now automatically stretched so that the student can work on the STEM project from the dorm. At some point, the student finishes working on the project disconnects and goes to bed. And the service automatically contracts. Now let's imagine a hacker wanted to disrupt the STEM project. Well, without the right credentials, 
the hacker won't be able to connect to the STEM project service and therefore won't be able to disrupt DOS or otherwise hack it. This makes the service inherently more secure. You cannot hack a service if it's not connected. To sum up, services stretch and contract as needed as users or devices connect, disconnect and roam. The service is only active for the duration of the legitimate user connection. This process is automatic and is driven by the identity and policies attached to those users or devices and does not require any manual intervention. The security benefit is the reduced attack surface because the service is only enabled where and when strictly required. To some additional benefits such as reduced and necessary broadcast and Mac learning which result in better performance and higher stability. Number 10. I definitely could continue talking on and on about SPB scalability, fast convergence, optimal performance and many other things. But rather than doing that, I want to close by giving you an idea of the type of verticals and use cases where SPB is deployed today. And this includes universities, government, service providers, metros, utilities, IoT use cases, intelligent transportation, data centers, video surveillance, smart cities, and more. So that brings me to the end. I hope you're now as enthusiastic about SPB as I am. And as usual, thanks for watching this video. Hope it's been useful and see you soon. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you sign up to our Space Workers community where you will find plenty of useful resources. Check it out.